I grew up in San Diego in the suburbs, but when I was 19 years old, I moved into my mother-in-law's house in Pennsylvania, where my two infant children, my then wife, Laurel, her mother, and her teenage sisters all lived in a house with three bedrooms. Laurel was cheating on me, Laurel's mom was encouraging it, and they were both getting smashed at the wicked googly several nights a week. Her sisters liked to call each other bitch and slut every few minutes and enjoyed breaking down each other's doors and to take clothing from each other. I was also chalking Laurel down from suicide or self-harm once a week or so. The basement was a fetid mess of molding clothes, furniture, and cat shit. Every morning, Laurel's mom looked into her giant box of pills and decided whether to take her medically necessary thyroid medication or whether to spice things up with Vicodin, Xanax, or a new antidepressant instead. My all-consuming project was trying to fix all these problems that were far beyond my comprehension. To top it all off, the giant ass TV in the living room was constantly playing Jersey Shore. <laughs> Things were fabulous. I worked for a tree service. Chainsawing, lifting logs, and tossing branches into the grinder was a good way to get, my get into my body and take a break from the insanity of being at home. The problem was their equipment was old and always breaking down. On one occasion, I was going to be out of work for a couple weeks. Laurel's grandmother, who we called Bubby, heard I was going to be out of work, talked to her friend, and called me up one Thursday to let me know that I would, would have work the next morning. Her friend Rondon would pick me up at 7, and he'd pay me 10 bucks an hour, which is what I'd be making at the tree service anyway. I thought I had heard before that Rondon worked at the cemetery. I was kind of curious, kind of apprehensive, and mostly exhausted, so I stopped thinking about it. The next morning, I got ready and went outside. In not too long, I saw an enormous lifted F-250 with a cap on the back rolling down the street. I stopped, it stopped in front of the door, and I hopped in. A couple words about Rondon. First, his name is Rondon. <laughs> not Ronald, not Donald, but Rondon. He was about 50 years old, and he lived out in the woods near Bubby. Rondon was a real yinzer from Pittsburgh with a thick accent. One time, Rondon's girlfriend left him, and he got suicidal. Police were called, and he ended up in an armed standoff that lasted for four hours. I got in the truck, and Rondon asked me, you know where's I work? No. Up there at a cemetery. You know what an exhumation is? Isn't that where you dig somebody up? Yep. There's a six-month-old baby whose mom just died, and now we've got to dig it up because she wants to be buried with it. I started to get that giddy feeling that I usually got before doing something really stupid. <laughs> this was going to get a little weird. Weird enough that I would probably be distracted enough not to worry about Laurel and her family so much. Weird enough that I was going to have some shiny new emotions to process. <laughs> Weird enough that when I got back home, I would have a story to tell, and I might get some positive attention for once. Shit, even Laurel's mom was going to listen to this story. She loved horror movies, goth bands, and the occult. She might even be jealous. And plus, they might give this some sort of cosmic significance, but I knew that it was just an object that we were going to dig up. An object worthy of respect because alive people are wired to care about their dead, but intrinsically just an object. Sure, I was going to feel some emotions about it. I have the same wiring as everybody else. But it wasn't going to get to me the way it might get to some people. Ah, say you armchair psychologists out there. <laughs> You were just intellectualizing your problems. You weren't letting yourself experience your true feelings. <laughs> Hell yes! I was intellectualizing my problems. <laughs> intellectualizing problems was how I got through life. I couldn't feel it when Laurel told me that she was going to go pour bleach on her vagina. I couldn't feel it when Laurel said that I wasn't aggressive enough in bed. I couldn't feel it when Laurel was incredibly hostile to me every time she spent the day with her mom. I couldn't feel the gnawing sensation that my family wasn't going to escape this intact. I'd go crazy. So I boxed up my feelings and clung to the belief that somehow, someday, I was going to find the solution to all of our problems and everything would be okay. All I had to do was find the rational way to get there. Same thing with a dead baby. <laughs> it's easy to intellectualize your feelings about dead babies. I had two alive babies. Alive babies who were being taken care of by my binge-drinking, marriage-wrecking, drug-taking, manipulative mother-in-law. 
If I could intellectualize that problem, I could intellectualize pulling a dead baby out of the ground and putting it back in again. <laughs> However, knowing a dead baby is just an object and wanting to see a dead baby are two different things, and that made me anxious. Were we going to see the baby, or was it going to be fully contained in a coffin or something? Seeing a dead baby might be more shiny new emotions than I really wanted. <laughs> I wanted to get a little weird, not to have nightmares. I didn't actually ask Rondon what we were going to see, because moving from San Diego to Pennsylvania had taught me that if I let on how much of their blue-collar knowledge I didn't have, I was going to catch some shit for it. We arrived at the cemetery and pulled up to a small barn. Inside was a backhoe, long mowing equipment, and various other tools. Rondon loaded up the backhoe, gave me a couple shovels, and we headed out towards the grave. We got to the grave site, and I read the headstone. This baby died in 1956? Yep. Keep it cool. Don't let him know you're a sheltered kid from the suburbs. Okay. Okay, so most of what I need from you is just to spot me because I can't see what I'm working with from up here. Okay. So just let me know if we hit something. Okay. I stood there with a shovel while he adjusted the backhoe over some dirty sheets of plywood he used to protect the grass and put down the feet. He scraped the first bit of dirt off the top of the ground. He took a long stroke, starting by the headstone, pulling evenly a few inches deep to the other end of the grave. He piled the dirt in a trailer attached to a lawn tractor. The backhoe took another bite out of the ground, then another. I stood there watching. I thought about the baby, I thought about home, but I mostly just appreciated the moment. The backhoe was too loud for conversation, so for me it was quiet. No one was yelling. I didn't have any complicated emotional problems to fix. I hardly even had to work. Just a peaceful moment alone in my head. Just me and my thoughts on a peaceful day of grave digging. <laughs> Eventually it was time to dump the trailer, so he took it down to the edge of the woods, and when he came back and started digging again. We got a little deeper and I started paying attention, but I still wasn't sure what I was looking for. Presumably not a skeleton? A coffin? If the backhoe hits the coffin, won't it break? My grandfather's funeral was six months before, and they put his coffin inside a big concrete thing in the ground. I thought that thing was called a vault, but I wasn't sure. But this baby was buried in 1956. Did they use vaults in 1956? Several trailer loads later, we still hadn't hit anything. Then I saw something that looked like a rock. Stop, I yelled, and Rondon came down to take a look at it. There it is. He got back in the backhoe and started digging. He was careful, but he scraped it a bit. Enough for me to realize that it was a cement vault, not a coffin, and not a skeleton. He dug out around the vault, which was only about four feet long. Eventually, I had to get down into the hole to scoop the dirt off the sides of the vault. So I was scraping a metal shovel against this baby's last and final resting place, trying to make it the least possible amount of clanging. At some point, digging around the vault required me to step onto the vault. I gave a silent apology for it. When I needed to move to a different side, Rondown put down a ladder next for me, to me for me to get out. I noticed that without the ladder, I might be stuck. Eventually, Rondon and I hooked chains around the edges of the vault, which Rondon attached to the backhoe, and we started to pull it out. There was a little bit of a <laughs> as it came free and Rondon placed it gently on the trailer for the lawn tractor. To my surprise, he drove it to the barn. We cleaned up, Rondon put plywood over the open grave, then we stood outside the barn. Thanks for your help today, he said. You're just gonna leave it in the barn? Yeah, the burial is until Monday, so we'll sit in the barn until then. That got to me. Most of the day I had successfully placed inside my rationalized box. It was just digging up a coffin. It was just a trippy experience. But something about leaving a 50 years dead baby in a barn for the weekend didn't sit right. And something about not necessarily being there when the baby was reburied didn't sit right either. I might need some help on Monday with the burial. You want to do that? Asked Rondon. I don't know whether I have work on Monday or not, so we'll see, I said. I was feeling more than a little unsettled when Rondon dropped me off at home. Luckily, I got called off of work for Monday, so I was able to be there and put the baby back in the ground. I waited near the barn while the burial ceremony finished. 
Then I came over to help put down the tent and lower both vaults into the grave. First we lowered the mother, then the baby on top of her. You know how the saying is six feet underground? That baby could not have been more than three feet from ground level, and I could see in Rondon's face that he fucked up. And then I saw him decide that it was good enough. We filled the grave, mounted the dirt a foot over the grave so it would be flush when it settled, and then I went home. Give it up for Vamp first-timer Jesse O'Sullivan!